All right. The first thing I want to do is just to just to clarify. I, I said in the last class, I used the words, the Rebbe's Haggadah or the so-and-so Haggadah. I want to make it clear. The Rebbe didn't write a Haggadah. And right, the Haggadah, as we explained last week, is a conglomerate of generations. When we say the Rebbe's Haggadah, you mean a Haggadah with Rebbe's commentary on it, and likewise with any other, as much if that was 100% clear last time. So if I say the Sfas Emes Haggadah, it means Haggadah with the Sfas Emes's commentary. So you said that was the only book that he wrote. Right, so the only book, the that's right, the only book they ever wrote was a compilation of commentaries, or not just compilations, his own original commentary based on a compilation of sources on the Haggadah. Not that he wrote a Haggadah, he wrote a commentary on the Haggadah. So that's why I wasn't clear. I knew I wasn't clear, so I wanted to clarify that. Okay. Sorry? Uh, not of this one. No, I don't. Okay, so today we do the Hamalach Ma'anya. If you want to see the English translation, I'll translate as we read. Hey, ha, kehe, different versions. Hey, lach ma'anya, actually, here. Chabad If you want to see the translation in English, it's in the Siddur. I don't know what page it's on, but I'll translate as we read it. So, another thing I want to read before we begin is, even though we said last week that there are primary parts of the Haggadah which comprise the obligation of retelling the story, Right, this obligation of the night. One of the one of the biblical commandments that you do. There are a few of them, biblical commandments. One of them eating matzah, and one of them is to retell the story. And we said last week that there are certain parts of Haggadah that are crucial to that. None. So, if you needed, if whatever the circumstance was, if you had guests and you're leading the say there, you want to know what parts to tell people. This is what you have to read. Right, but otherwise, expecting that you're reading the whole Haggadah. Right? But it's good to know, just if you have guests, to tell them, okay, this paragraph is required by Jewish law as a biblical commandment to read this paragraph, to say this paragraph. So I just want to read a quote from Maharil. The Maharil is um, known as the father of all Ashkenazi custom. And he wrote the following words, and the Rebbe quotes it in his Haggadah, again in his commentary on the Haggadah. Every man should be scrupulously fearful to fulfill the words of our sages who have instructed the mitzvah of following the Seder with the Haggadah and the matter should not be light in his eyes. Even though if there are many things that happen through the Seder that seem like it's insignificant, he should take it into consideration that notwithstanding his lack of knowledge, it is a matter of great importance. End quote from Maril. So even though it's true that there are some parts of the Haggadah that are more important in terms of biblical commandment, but each part of the Haggadah is full of commentary, full of meaning, and laden with history, so the whole thing is important. Now the first paragraph we read in the Haggadah is the Helach Manya. Now this Helach Manya is not part of the retelling of the story, it's not, and it's written in Aramaic, so presumably it was comprised sometime when the Jews were in Babylonia. I don't think it, f- it doesn't, it's not found in the Gemara, the first time it's found printed is in, we mentioned last week those early Haggadahs in the eighth in year 800, somewhere around there. That's where the first time this paragraph appears. So it's in the first Haggadah, so you can assume it went, it went back earlier. Okay, so let's, let's read the paragraph and let's see some different layers of commentary. Hey, Lach Ma'anya, this is the bread of the poor man's bread or the bread of affliction. Diachalo Avasana, that our forefathers ate. Ba'ar de Mitzrayim in the land of Egypt. Obviously, they didn't eat this actual ma- bread that we're looking at, the matzah, but they ate bread that looked like this called Dichsin, Dichfin, Yesev Yechel, anybody who's hungry, let him come and eat. Called Ditzich, anyone who's lacking or needs. Yesev Yifsach, let him come and join in our Pesach. Hashtahacha, now we are here. The Shanha Baba Ard Yisrael, next year we'll be in the land of Israel. Hashta Avdin, now we are slaves. We aren't um, self governing. The Shanha next year B'nei Chayim will be free men. Okay, so first let's learn, read this on a simple, on the basic level, what, what is being said here. So the first commentary on the bottom there comes from the Urchus Chaim. He says like this, Halach Manya, this is the bread of affliction. Pirish means to say, Zois Haidolatinekes, this is a, we're informing the children, Lama Nachna Machalka Namachashtayim, why are we breaking the bread into two? The thing we did just before the, before the Magid is Yachatz, we broke the middle matzah. So the child already wants to know, what are we doing here? So we're explaining to him, why? Kadaka Shalani, like a poor person who puts away half. 
the lacham only achlo of aseinu b'mitzrayim derech ipazin, because our because our forefathers ate poor man's bread in Egypt on their way out. He's addressing a simple question. The Haggadah says, "This is the bread of, that our forefathers ate in Mitzrayim." It's not what they ate in Mitzrayim. It's they ate when they left. Although they did eat, when they, did they, they, eat were they, they were commanded. They were commanded to eat matzah then, right? They were commanded to eat matzah with them with their Pesach the night before they left. But it's not the lechem only. It's not poor man's bread. No, it's the, the story we're describing here that they're poor and they left. So that's what he says. The lechem only achlo v'sin in Mitzrayim derech ipozin. So he seems to be saying that the Jews were eating poor man's bread in Egypt in haste, notwithstanding or irrespective of the exodus. Even while in Egypt, there were poor people and they were eating quickly because they were always being oppressed. They didn't have time to leisurely make their fancy breads. This is what it seems to be saying. That in Egypt. And Machalk and Apas the Shtayim, and they would break their breads in half, Lachavarayim for their friends, called like a person who eats quickly, quickly they would take a piece. He seems to be describing not the exodus, but actually the um, the slavery. That they were eating this in slavery. And they, our forefathers, would tell each other. Call Dixon Yesiv Yechel, whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. So the whole paragraph here is not us speaking. It's us telling our children what they were saying. That's what the Orchus Chaim is telling us. This is the bread of our forefathers. And when that our forefathers ate in Egypt when they were in, in, uh, in their torment. And this is what they would tell each other. Whoever's hungry, come to my house, eat. Peter, if you didn't have time to prepare your food because you were being beaten by an Egyptian, come to my house, I'll give you. And I have ready-made bread. Others say that it's in parentheses, puts another explanation that those say that those who were who um, kept themselves hungry in Arab Pesach let them come and eat matzah in, in enjoyment. But close brackets get back to the story of people in Egypt. Sorry? I don't have any more copies, I'm sorry. So getting back to that story of the Jews in Egypt. They're in Egypt. They're pained, so they don't have time to make fancy bread. They're making poor man's bread. They're making matzah. They were so quickly making their food, not everybody had time to make it. So one guy would say to his friend, you didn't have a chance to make matzah, make food today? No problem, come to my house, I have for you. Anybody who needs, let him come and join us. And don't be worried about it. Come to us. And then they would tell each other, Hashta hacha, now we're here. Next year we're going to be in Israel. Klema meaning to say, we should be happy now. If we, have to, if we now eat our bread in haste, so next year we'll be in Israel. Anyone will eat in Israel in, in peace and in, in leisure, leisurely. Is that a word? And if now we're slaves, we're all going to be free. Call them a sapper. All of this we are telling our children. That our children, that, that our forefathers said. And we are copying them. It's a simple reading. We're telling the children we're breaking the matzah and eating this matzah. That's what they did. And we're copying them. And the whole paragraph here is really our forefathers in Egypt speaking. Reading number one. Next page. And this last MS. The Gerer Rebbe. It's the second Gerer Rebbe, right? For the Sharim and the Svasanas. I think so. Okay. Lechem Oini, poor man's bread. Lechem Afarshim Nechleku. The commentaries argued Imhu Simen Alagolus. When we say uh, poor man's bread, is talking about the exile, the Inoy and the, and the, the persecution. Or are we talking about the freedom? Like which bread is it? The bread they ate when they were running out or the bread they ate when they were, when they were in Egypt? We saw. One, we can imagine it being the other. Mudivir Rashi Ramban, and it seems from, the, from Rashi and the Ramban, two earlier commentaries, Yira, it seems, Shahu Alainu, that it's for the persecution. Maral Zal, but the Maral, Lehut Tabeinav, doesn't, didn't like this. Okay. Now, by Messenger, it seems to me, says the Svas this is what it is. Kihu, that this bread is, is al Klal Hayridle Mitzrayim Vagula, is on the general. Uh, the whole story, not just the persecution, the whole story, the persecution and the redemption. Because certainly, it's incumbent upon us to praise Hashem for the exile too. This is not someone writing who was living in Canada in Hampstead. 
didn't live the, the, the luxuries we did. He understands what Golos is. And he says that we have to thank Hashem for Golos too. Now he's saying this on a simple reading because the, we're calling it poor man's bread, but yet we're celebrating at the same time. In other words, like, so like, are, are we, we're, celeb- we're, we're praising Hashem for the miracle, and at the same time it's poor man's bread remembering the affliction. So he's saying the praises on all of it, on the affliction and the redemption. The imloy came. Because if we didn't appreciate, if we don't understand and appreciate exile, ma what's the praise of redemption? If we're capable of, for us to get close to Hashem, please it without exile. In Cain, In other words, if, the, if uh, going through exile was the necessary process to get close to Hashem, so be it. We'll praise Him for the whole process. And if it means to be free and not get to Hashem, not interested. Not interested. El Avada, therefore, must be if in the fact that we did go through exile, Hagolos Haya eats the Shnuch Leskar Vashmis Parach. That Golos itself was necessary and was part of the process of getting as close to Hashem, and therefore thank Him for that too. It's a pretty heavy idea. And he explains the next pad, the next uh, column. Although I'm skipping some of it, but but Pasha Tishleimer, we might say simply. Exile is with the purpose that we become um, we become uh, lowly and, and subservient to Hashem. To, to deflate our egos a little bit. To be humbled. As you've seen many times, Hashem is barach, but Hashem wonders this in this manner. That in order for Hashem, in order for the Jew, for the person to be able to receive God's goodness, and shouldn't be ruined by his ego. And it seems to me that all things that happen bad in this world are for this reason. So the person doesn't ruin the good he gets with his ego. It's pretty heavy. And this is, this is where the Svas Emes understands the Halach and the Haggadah going forward. The whole, not, it's not just the, it was terrible and now it's great, forget about how terrible it was. You can't appreciate how good it was if you don't remember how bad it was. You can't appreciate what it means to be close to Hashem if you don't remember what it was like to be distant from Hashem. You can't appreciate the blessings, the life, if a person doesn't remember where it came from. So getting back to last week, remember we're using the word derogatory. So not use that word, but the Haggadah says what the, 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 the uh, requirement is to begin in a place of, of uh, what's the word we're looking for? Negativity, hardship, suffering. and then from suffering, the direct, the, uh, the direct translation of Ganai was shame. And from there we're going to a place of praise. Because the praise without the, pre- the, the precursor of that which is unpraiseworthy, and the praise is almost worthless. There's no Matan Torah, there's no Mount Sinai without Mitzrayim. So the praise is for both of it. It's for all of it. But there's always been a question of does it have to be like that? In other words, like from God's to infinite uh, capability of doing things? I don't know. Yeah. Deborah discusses it a few times actually. There's a beautiful sikha, but this of you can leave that up for now. Okay. okay. Sorry? The Svastam must live before that. In order to get the end of Israel, you had to do this for me. must live before that. But at any rate, this idea that it's not just that we're thanking Hashem that we got out of Golas, but we're thanking Hashem for, and for a, in other words, it's not just that we're thanking Hashem for getting rid of our Golas, for getting rid of our exile. We're time. thanking Hashem for what we have, and we understand that we cannot have what we have unless we go through this whole process. And if we're thankful for putting us through this process and giving us this whole thing, okay. and therefore it's the bread of affliction and the bread of pl- praise, it's both simultaneously. Incorporating both the ideas that it's the bread of, the poor man's bread is both the poor man's bread they ate when they were running out of Egypt and the poor man's bread they ate in Egypt. Incorporating both of them. Because the praise is on both of them. Now, as far as the next one is from the Chsam Seifer. Sorry? In the Orchus Chaim? Doesn't, doesn't explain. 
He's only really asking why it's called oini. Why it's called the hamoni. Why it's called poor man's bread. That's really what he's asking. Okay. So the Chsam Sefer. Chsam Sefer is a famous Hungarian Rav. And he writes like this. So Yesh Leimar, the, the bottom of the page, second page. Since we find ourselves in exile, what do we gain by the exodus from Egypt? We're back in exile anyway. So, if, in other words, let's, let's, I don't know if the Chsam Sefer read the Svas Emes, but let's just assume the Svas Emes, let's just take, even with what the Svas Emes said. Okay, so we have to go through the process to get to where we were. But then we went back down. Now we're again in Golos, yeah. We're going on and on and on and praising about the story of Exodus when we're still sitting here in exile. In other words, if we're at the end of the story and we praise Hashem for bringing us this whole way, I get it. But we're not at the end of the story. We're still in exile. We're back in exile. So what are we, what are we so excited about the Exodus from Egypt for? We're back in exile. So he says a beautiful word. Yes, then one might say, to be Mitzrayim in, in Egypt, we did not have the capability of hastening our redemption. In any, under any circumstances. From the time that was allotted to Avram. Before the Jews went to Egypt, God told Avram, your children will be in exile in a foreign land, and after a certain amount of time, you'll come out. Right? So there was no, nothing the Jews could do to, uh, to change that. This was the allotted time, that's it. And the fact that God decided to make it shorter because he told him 400 years, a little less. So how did that happen? Because he counted, he counted the time from Yitzchak's birth, giving it another, an extra, uh, extra how long? A good 200 years. 190, right? 190 years. Or the fact that how difficult the pain was made up for the lack of years, or some other explanations for how the, the 400 allotted years got sliced down to 210, because that's how long they were actually in Egypt, even though they were told that they're going to be for 400. But the bottom line is, none of these things were done because the Jews merited it. They couldn't do anything. This is, what God, this is how long God decided they're going to be in. So God played with his own rules and made it happen. But it wasn't, it was never told, the Jews were never told, if you follow God's rule, you'll be redeemed that didn't exist in Egypt. It was a predetermined program. And if you think about it, it's incredible. It's a, if you're, 210 years means that there could have been a person who was born and died in slavery and never met a person who wasn't a slave. His father and grandfather, if he saw them both, could have both been born in slavery. 210 years is a very long time. Right? And there's nothing they can do about it. Finish. So there's a guy who was born and dies in exile because this is what God predetermined before it even started. Nothing he can do. But when it comes to this exile, says the Chesav Sefer, there is no lot of time. And the Gemara says, The Gemara in Sanhedrin, the famous Gemara, where they asked, I think it was Eliyahu, they asked the Eliyahu, when's Mashiach going to come? And he said, he'll come today if you, follow, uh, if you uh, adhere to God's command. It's only dependent upon us. And there are various different easy mitzvahs a person could do. When a person does them, it hastens the redemption. The easiest of all the mitzvahs to do that could hasten the redemption. Our sages say, Tzedakah's great is charity. It brings the redemption. It's a verse that indicates that uh, redemption is associated with with um, charity and therefore our exile is like one who has quote bread in his basket it's an expression the Gemara used to describe someone who has bread in his basket is not as hungry as someone who doesn't have any bread in his basket and when someone doesn't know when the next meal is going to come they're much hungrier than the person who knows and I get home I have a meal waiting for me so because it says the Chsam Seifer the Jew in, in, in Egypt think of that guy who was born and knows that the 400 year mark is another 300 years from now so this is my life. I'm going to be born. I'm born here in, in slavery, and I'm dying in slavery. My children are going to be born in slavery, and probably also die in slavery. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's finished. Whereas, for us, knowing that our actions hasten the gula, 
this is some surface speaking. In other words, what he's saying is, the exile itself is a different kind of exile, knowing that your actions are part of bringing the gula, part of bringing the redemption. So it's not just that the redemption might come today. It's not the way he describes it. He's saying it's as if you have bread in your basket. In other words, you have it in your hands. So let's say in theory, forget present company excluded. Let, let's back up 100 years now. Someone from the Sam Seifer's age. So he was born and he passed away in exile. But what's the difference between him and the guy who was born in exile, born in Egypt and passed away in Egypt? The guy who was born in Egypt and died in Egypt, his entire life knew that nothing he did mattered. Whereas Sam Seifer, even the day he passed away, knew that everything he did brought the Gula closer, even if he didn't live to see it. His exile was a different exile. Knowing that what he is doing is part of the process of bringing the redemption. Well, he also didn't Who? The Jews then. That's what he's saying. Or it's a whole different experience, our exile now. The alien next of the Gaulus Khan like Gaulus and Therefore, in that respect, in the psychological respect, our, our exile is nothing to be compared to the exile from Egypt. Behind you, the Amr, this is what it means when it says, that this is this bread of affliction is the bread of forefather ate. Pirish mean to say, This matzah is exactly like the matzah that our forefathers ate in Egypt. Because right now we're also in exile. So what do we mean when we say this is our bread, the, our bread our forefathers ate? What, it, what the Haggadah means to say is, you're also in exile. But now we have the opportunity to, to bring it closer. I did mitzvah staka through, through, through uh, charity. So what's the next line we say in the Haggadah? Whoever's hungry, come and eat. So we're saying this is the bread of our forefathers. We're also in exile eating poor man's bread. But we have a difference. We can invite guests and do charity. And that charity brings school a closer. And we say, all those who are hungry, let them come and eat. In that merit, this year we'll be here. Next year we'll be in Israel. But there's another comment there. So you see how, you see how, the, how, the, how, the, how, the, how it goes? This is, our, this is the bread of affliction. You're indeed in exile. But it's different. Because you can invite guests. You can give charity. And you do that. This year we're in Egypt. This year we're slaves, next year we're in, we're in Gula. So even our exile is a different kind of exile, knowing that everything we're doing brings forth to Gula, specifically Mitzvah Just a couple of things. Maybe we're not. Okay. You're inviting a person to come. You're sitting down or No, yeah, you made Kiddush already. Hello. So this uh, actually answered the question. Are you this answer, no. After the that's a great question. And this, and first of all, there's a lot of before, there's many, many commentaries ask about that. Why? Many countries ask that why we're inviting guests when we're already sitting down at the table. But actually, in the Psalm Sefer's reading, it makes sense. Because you're not inviting guests. You're talking about the nature of our exile. The nature of our exile is that you can invite people and give tzvaka. Okay. You're not actually making the declaration in that sense. In the Psalm Sefer reading, not necessarily. You're not actually sending an invitation. You're describing what kind of exile we're in. We're the kind of exile where you can invite guests, where you can give charity, and thus bringing... So actually, this answers the question. I didn't even think about that, but now that I think about it, it does. Okay, final commentary. This comes from the Rebbe. Not from the Rebbe's Agada, but from the Rebbe's commentary in general. And okay, it's long. I can read the whole thing, but we'll get to the main points. Okay, it's a little bit long. We're not going to read the whole thing in Hebrew. We'll just make the, say the main points. The Rebbe reads the Haggadah, the Halef Manu like this. First of all, the Rebbe says as follows. When a Jew is in exile, so is the Shechina is in exile. The Chol Tzara, some light Tzara, the verse says, in all of your pain, or in their pain, the Jewish people's pain, God's in pain, so to speak. The Shechina, the presence of Hashem, is, lives with the Jew. When the Jews are sent to exile, this is a quote from the Gemara, when Jews are, are, in, are, in, are in exile, the presence of Hashem is in exile as well. And therefore, uh, and so what happens in exile? What's the nature of exile in its spiritual sense? The na- or at its core, the nature of exile is the inability that you has to perceive Hashem. That's the core of the whole of all of exile. I said the story uh, a few times, but it makes the makes the point kind of the there's a Gemara. The Gemara, the Talmud says that that a person should make. Abracha, should thank Hashem for that which, for the negative, with the same enthusiasm he does for the positive. So the story goes that there were two brothers of Pinchas and Pshmelka, famous two brothers who went to the Magad of Mezrich. The Magad of Mezrich is the Bashem to successor. And they asked the Magad, how do you explain this Gemara? You're supposed to thank Hashem with the same enthusiasm for something negative as you do for the positive? How do you do that? So the Magad told them, go to the Bzusha. 
Rebzusha Vani Poli, famous Rebzusha. Rebzusha was an impoverished man who lived a very difficult life. And they went to him and they said, the Magad told you, told us, asked the question, how do you thank Hashem for the good just like you do for the bad? So the Zusha said, you must be making a mistake. Nothing ever bad happened to me in my life. So they, understood that, they understood that this was the answer that they were supposed to get. In other words, if a person sees Hashem in everything, then where's the, where's the sadness? Where's the, where's the exile? There is no exile. There is no exile. You know, there's a... It's an interesting thing. There, there's a... The last mime that ever handed, the last mime that ever handed out, was the famous mime of Atl Tzava. It's a mime that's really connected to Purim Katan. And in it, the Rebbe talks about, towards the end of the Mimer, the Rebbe talks about this idea that a person ought to feel crushed by exile, even though we're living in a land of opportunity, a land of plenty. But we should feel, we should feel persecuted, if you will, in our own minds, by the fact that we don't experience godliness in our, in our lives. And then the Rebbe adds the following line. Even someone who feels who does live with the presence of Hashem, but the very fact that others don't live that way means that even the level of godliness he's enjoying isn't the ultimate. And for that, he should feel crushed. For that, he should feel pained. It's in the mind right there. Who's ever talking about? That's, that's experiencing uh, godliness, but that other people aren't. Right? The point I'm making here is is that the essence of exile is the inability to perceive Hashem. And that is what it means to be poor. Lechem the bread of poor, the poor man's bread. The Gemara says, Ain on the elabadas. A poor man is not poor unless he's poor in his mind. So this idea of being poor in our ability to perceive the truth, to see Hashem, we're walking around in a place of darkness and a place of questions. So, Dagada continues. We're halach manya. We're, we're living in a poor man's bread, and therefore the achala avasana that our forefathers ate, translate a little bit differently. But it's eaten our forefathers. Not our forefathers ate, but it's eaten our forefathers. What does this mean, our eaten our forefathers? Fathers in Kabbalah refer to intellect. How so? Because intellect gives birth to emotions. So in Kabbalah, the intellect is referred to as parents, father and mother, two different parts of, of, the, of the mind, Chachma and Bina. So our forefathers, our fathers, our brains are eaten because we don't see, we don't see godliness. We don't have that perception. So it's been eaten up because we're in Egypt. But the Haggadah continues. Sorry? Sorry? And that's, our, and that's where our average of time. That's where we're in Egypt. And then the Haggadah continues. But call this in But if you want to, you can go and eat. Meaning to say, notwithstanding the fact, notwithstanding the fact, that we're in exile and, and the perceiving godliness is not obvious. If you want it, you can go and get it. And it'll be available to you. And not only that, called Ditzich Yesev Yifsach, you'll get more than you need. Not just you'll, if, you're, if you're hungry, you can come and eat. You're starving and nothing left. But even if you want more, you can get more and more engaged and engage more in, in, in Hashem's truth. And if that's the case, Hash now we're here, but Nashan Habab, next year we'll be in, we'll be in, 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 in uh, redemption. Because essentially, with perceiving Hashem's truth, we are in redemption. So notwithstanding the fact that now we're in a place where godliness is not revealed, but nonetheless, for the one who's hungry and the one who's searching and the one who wants it, you can go get it. And you can get more than you need. And if we talk and go get it, then we'll bring ourselves, like the Sam Sefer said, we bring ourselves to the, to the ultimate redemption. So here we have a few different layers of halachmanya. Okay.